Hello and welcome to the IA channel. My name is Alexander Hammond. I am a policy advisor to a director general here at the IA. Um, and thank you for joining us in this latest webinar in a series of videos conceived and hosted by the Institute of Economic Affairs. It seems international trade faces an uncertain future. Between 1978 and 2008, the growth of international trade seemed unstoppable. Trade as a percentage of global GDP accelerated from just 34%, almost a third, in 1978 to more than 60% at its peak in 2008. However, in the last decade or so, trade has actually stagnated and slightly decreased as a proportion of world GDP. This downward trend, coupled with threats from a coronavirus, we're hearing calls from voices on both the left and the right towards more national self-sufficiency, really raises a lot of questions about the future and direction of trade. Is protectionism and the goal of national self-sufficiency the new normal? Given the fragility of supply chains, should we try and curb our dependence on other nations? Are we condemning ourselves to live poorer and less prosperous lives if we do? And where on earth does China and our future relations with them fit into all of this? As usual with IA events, I'm joined by two absolutely tremendous guests to discuss all these questions and more. First up, I have one of the stars of the UK neoliberal movement, the formidable Sam Bowman. Sam's a dear friend of the IA, and he is currently the Director of Competition Policy at the International Centre for Law and Economics. He is also a Senior Fellow of the Adam Smith Institute, having previously served as their Executive Director. Sam's also a non-executive director of the drug policy think tank Boltface and a co-founder of the Entrepreneurs Network. My second guest is also a star. He's more of a star of the UK classical liberal political movement, formerly, now just a star of the IA in general, and one of our viewers' favourites, the great Saeed Kamau. Saeed is the academic and research director here at the Virtual Institute of Economic Affairs, and he's also a professor of international relations and politics at St. Mary's University. Between 2005 and 2009, Said served as a Conservative MEP for London, and he was leader of the European Conservatives and Reformist political group of MEPs. Gents, it's great to have you both with me today. Well, thank you for asking us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so to start out this discussion, I'll <clears throat> have both my guests, starting with Sam, and then moving on to Said. just four or five minutes to lay out what do you think is the future of trade going to look like post-coronavirus? So, Sam, is it all doom and gloom, or have you got any reasons for us to be optimistic at all? Um, I'm reasonably optimistic. Um, I want to start by saying everything I'm talking about is about a post-vaccine world. Um, it may be that it takes us a few years to get a vaccine, but I think eventually we probably will get one. And um, we, what we're talking about is what the world looks like after that. Um, it, those sort of intervening purgatory years may be very unpleasant, very, very difficult. Um, and I don't really know what they're going to look like. Um, but the thing when we're looking ahead to that is to bear in mind that looking back, there were already really big moves towards protectionism um, pre-COVID. Um, I think that these were driven really by three different issues, um, all rela related to each other. One is this misdiagnosis of trade um, as the cause of the hollowing out of the middle class in the US and in other industrial countries, um, including the UK. One is this feeling by countries that are otherwise quite developed of missing out on the kind of um, industries of the future. Um, so, for example, Europe's anxiety about not really having any big tech players. And the third of these important trends is the geopolitical fears, um, especially of countries like China, um, to a lesser extent, perhaps, of India. But China is the really big one. And we see this uh, to a greater or lesser extent in things like Trump, um, in things like Brexit, um, although many people, I'm sure, did not support Brexit for those reasons, but some did. Um, in the kind of what you might call Mayist uh, communitarianism, Theresa May style, uh, viewing out of trade as um, sort of a threat to the English way of life, um, and of course in the European Union's attack on uh, big tech companies. And um, often this doesn't take the form of tariffs. Often this takes the form of what are called non-tariff barriers. And these can be forms of regulation, um, but one of the increasingly used tools is um, competition and competition policy. And where competition policy is usually a way of um, encouraging markets to be op more open and to uh, be more competitive, they uh, give it gives governments great powers to do things like to stop investment taking place, uh, to stop mergers from taking place. And when a government is concerned about, for example, a foreign country having too much influence in its country, 
um, whether it be for national security reasons or for political reasons. Um, governments are increasingly turning to um, various forms of competition policy to stop them, for, to stop those investments from taking place. So in the UK, um, prior to COVID and kind of under Theresa May, the government was consulting on a massive expansion of the national security test that it can apply to mergers. And um, currently, if a merger is seen to threaten national security in the UK under a fairly narrow band of um, what counts as threatening national security, the government can review it and review it separately to the Competition and Markets Authority. So it's a kind of parallel regime. Now, what the UK government wanted to do and was proposing was to massively expand this so that effectively any merger taking place in the UK, whether it involved foreign purchasers or not involving foreign purchasers, or whether it involved non-controlling stakes being bought in UK companies. And this could be in any sector, according to the laws that the UK government um, were considering, um, could be blocked by the UK government, not blocked by the independent CMA process, but blocked by one of the ministers of state, either the, uh, probably the uh, Bay's secretary. And this follows similar moves in the US to dramatically expand their national security um, apparatus. And in the US, they also explicitly said that they want other countries, including the UK, to adopt a similar regime. And if the UK did that, it would be exempted from a lot of America's um, uh, controls. So what we're seeing is um, various different countries, including the UK and the US, try to politicize the and, and significantly broaden the national security tests in mergers. And this really includes all kinds of investment, not just not just the merger of two companies. Um, for, I think, ultimately geopolitical reasons. I think ultimately the US is being driven here by a very deep concern about the rise of China. Um, perhaps to some extent for legitimate reasons, I don't want to make strong claims on that point. Um, but also to use these tools for political ends. So, the last, so one of the really significant mergers uh, that, were, that was kind of intervened in um, by the UK government was the purchasing of a defence supplier by um, a private equity company. Um, it was uh, eventually allowed through, but only after the Secretary of State had threatened to intervene on national security grounds and the buying, uh, the private equity company making the acquisition agreed to all sorts of commitments to do with jobs, pensions, um, investment in the UK, things that really don't have anything to do with national security. But they were using this test as a pretext to extract those political commitments. And they were coming under quite a lot of pressure from unions to do that. So uh, to, to I, I, I'm kind of running out of time, so I don't want to go into, and we, and we need to talk about post-COVID, but um, really what I want to do is set the scene. Um, I think COVID may be used as an excuse for furthering along these kinds of moves. I think that um, while there are really legitimate concerns about China, uh, particularly around the um, lurch towards authoritarianism of the, of the current Chinese regime and the current Chinese um, government, um, I think a lot of the arguments about COVID don't really add up. Um, I think that it's not at all clear how much conspiracy there has been by the Chinese government to, to cover things up. It's not at all clear how responsible the Chinese government is for the spread of COVID. I, I think they certainly could have done a lot of things a lot better, uh, but I think right now we don't yet know enough to make clear decisions about what our response should be. I think that really the first step is some kind of inquiry. Um, and yet we're already seeing moves by conservative MPs, by voices on the right in the UK, and perhaps we'll start to hear voices on the left say the same thing, that we need to punish China, we need to reshore um, supply chains, and we need to have robustness in supply chains. Now, we'll talk about this in, dis in the discussion. My view is that while robustness in supply chains is very useful and important, it's te generally not governments that are best at making judgments about them. It's generally the businesses that have their own skin in the game that are the best at making those decisions, because they're, they're more exposed than anybody to um, sudden shutdowns in goods being able to cross borders or people being able to cross borders. They have a really strong incentive to get it right. Um, and much stronger incentive to get it right than governments do, because governments can get things wrong a lot of the time, and they often don't get punished for them because people don't see the costs. So um, I don't want to take up any more time, but my view is we'll probably see continuations of the trends towards more protectionism. We'll probably see COVID used often on, I think, slightly false pretenses to um, justify this kind of geopolitical concern that people have about China. And I fear what that will mean is um, making it harder to trade with China, making it harder for businesses to invest in all, other in all sorts of other places under this guise of robustness, and probably much, much more stringent controls under the guise of national security, but often they have nothing to do with national security on the kinds of investment that foreign investors can make into the UK and on the kinds of deals that British companies can do with companies and investors from overseas. Thanks.
Wonderful. Thank you very much for your thoughts, there, Sam. So, Saeed, is COVID-19 just kind of going to be used as an excuse to accelerate pre-existing trends, or is there any reason to be optimistic? Sam doesn't seem to be optimistic at the moment. Maybe we can change his mind. What do you think, Saeed? Well, I think we just don't know uh, yet, yet. And uh, I thought what was very interesting was that in April, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, published its latest trade forecast for 2020. And what was interesting about that, it was, uh, uh, you know that most uh, p- forecasts by definition are wrong because quite often forecasters try to put a precise figure. And what the WTO did was they were far more, they were much smarter about this. They did a range of scenarios and they expect uh, global trade in goods. Remember, this is goods. Uh, this is what they call merchandise trade, not uh, trade in services. They expect it to drop by between 13 and 32% in 2020 as a result of the COVID pandemic. Now, what's really interesting is that they clearly expect it to bounce back in 2021, but they're not sure about the uh, nature of the recovery. And what, what they've done is they've published a graph on their website. And maybe if I'm able to do that, I'll be able to share it with you so your viewers can see that uh, you know, when they're watching this. Um, but they've got a number of trajectories. First of all, they show the growth in global uh, trade in terms of volumes up to about the financial crisis. And then you see in 2008, 2009, a dip and then a recovery. Um, but the recovery is a, along a slightly shallower trajectory um, than it would have been had there not been a financial crisis. Now, what they then do in this graph is suggest that, of course, there's going to be a dip in global volumes. Um, and they give two scenarios for the, uh, for the, for the recovery. And what's, uh, uh, both scenarios, they suggest, could well return to the same trajectory of growth, if you like, but overall volumes will be lower for, for a while. So I think you have to ask the question, you know, what could affect um, the, the recovery? So it's, uh, it, whether it's the pessimistic scenario or the optimistic scenario. And there are a number of things. One is just perception. You know, there will be a strong rebound if businesses and consumers view the pandemic as temporary, a one-time shock, and they can resume capital investment and consumer spending once lockdowns are ended. But if the rebound is weaker or if there's a second wave, and we hear in some countries there are hints of second waves in particular areas, then it could be more prolonged. Uh, for the recovery. Uh, As Sam said, supply chains, um, the World Economic Forum actually put on its website that the coronavirus coronavirus crisis has revealed the fragility of the modern supply chain. But how are companies going to respond? It's all very well saying they're fragile, but will they build in redundancy, duplication? That's expensive. Will they increase uh, storage and stock? One of the reasons they have just in time is that they don't have to spend so much on warehousing costs. And also they want to uh, adapt very quickly to changes in the market. Or maybe they can build up inventories, but they could share that risk somehow. Um, of course, the people are looking at the idea of reshoring, which is you know, relying on more local production. But that brings its own risk, especially in countries that, does, that do not have good industrial relations. And rather like people who build in areas that are close to volcanoes or close to, say, um, you know, uh, 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 bushes or woods, uh, they don't expect it to happen again very soon. So they might just go back to their, uh, their own behaviour or their old behaviour. So there's that. There's also the uh, US-China. Clearly, that, that, that whole debate and that whole dynamic will affect world trade. And we already saw world trade fall by uh, 0.1% in 2019 or about uh, $18 trillion. Um, interestingly enough, we saw the value of commercial services exports actually rise in t- uh, 2019. And the other factor could well be Technology. You know, there are some people who believe that trade in goods will be reduced over time as we have much better um, fabrication technology, 3D printing, you know, uh, for example. Now, how much 3D printing will affect exports in goods is still up for debate amongst academics. Clearly, you, know, you can't 3D print oil or chemicals, for example, but you can 3D print some parts and quite large parts. Um, and then, of course, there's also other issues such as the collapse of the WTO uh, dispute re- resolution mechanism. You know, don't forget, Trump has not nominated new judges, and that's affecting the ability of the WTO to do its work. And finally, the more demand, either for environmental reasons or uh, reasons of other, you know, other reasons for local sourcing, will that affect um, people's views of international trade as opposed to domestic trade? Wonderful. Thank you very much, both of you, for those fascinating thoughts. 
So I think it's best if maybe I always feel talking about China as the elephant in the room when we talk about international trade. So I think we should maybe start with them and then work our way out from there. Um, so you guys both agree to the we're pretty sure coronavirus is going to be seen as an acceleration of the current trade war between the US and uh, China. Um, but do you think broadly, if it is proven that China deliberately mismanaged this virus or uh, acted in very neglectful ways, can protectionism ever be justified against rogue states? And if we maybe think, okay, there's no proof that they've specifically done this in terms of coronavirus, um, what about in, say, what they had doing in Hong Kong? If we disagree with their actions in Hong Kong, can we justify the protectionism there? And I know, Sam, you've uh, written about Hong Kong very recently for CapEx. Um, so I'll turn to you first. And what are your thoughts? Protectionism, is it ever okay or is it not? Um, I think that... I, I, I tend to um, think that trade sanctions can actually be somewhat effective um, when it comes to smaller countries that are more economically exposed to trade with the countries doing the sanctioning. Um, I think it's quite difficult to imagine trade sanctions having a really significant effect on China without also really having, having a really significant effect on us as well. Um, and I mean, again, um, I, I kind of wonder, you know, what, 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 are the, what are the things that we're trying to achieve? Um, I mean, it, it's not going to come as a huge surprise to me if it turns out that the Chinese government is malevolent. Um, I know the Chinese government is a very malevolent um, institution. I know it's a very deceitful institution, and I know it's one that um, isn't really our friend. Having said that, um, China and the Chinese people getting richer is good for us, and it's good for the Chinese people. And um, until recently, the trend has been as China has opened up and um, got richer, it has gone in a more and more um, kind of open direction. So I don't, I, I, I worry that um, we may overreact and out of a kind of a sense of vengeance um, may end up being basically trying to impose um, kind of punishment on a country in order to get to its regime. And I think that that um, may end up being hurtful to us and may end up backfiring in terms of the things that we're really trying to do in China. I mean, I think really what we would like is a more open regime in China um, that is much more tolerant of um, the, the people in Hong Kong and is much more tolerant of its own people um, doing what they want. But I mean, China is powerful. We can't treat it like we would treat Iran or even Russia. Um, China being rich is good for all of us. Chinese ingenuity is good for all of us. And China being part of the global economy is good for all of us. And this isn't really the Cold War. Um, there aren't just two players. Um, there aren't just two camps. We have the European Union, we have India. To some extent, we have Russia, the UK, Japan, all of whom are players in this as well. And I would be much more interested in a kind of positive agenda um, to rather than to kind of treat this as a Cold War where we're trying to destroy China or trying to defeat an enemy, where we're trying to outflank them by uh, bringing other countries into our economic orbit and doing what we can, for example, to restart TPP. Um, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was always intended to bring countries in the Pacific Rim into the American economic and hopefully political orbit rather than the Chinese one. Now, abandoning that, which I think was a terrible, terrible decision, has really, really done a lot of damage. And it's fixing things like that and correcting those kinds of mistakes and trying to be, in a positive way, a kind of leader um, and drawing these kind of other countries that China is doing a lot to draw into its orbit into our own. And when I say our, I mean in the broad sense of kind of Western liberal democracies, I think would be a lot more productive and a lot more win-win for everybody than um, using kind of trade sanctions uh, to, to, I think, probably quite ineffectively punish the Chinese regime and ultimately risk punishing the Chinese people. Yeah, and I, I think that's what we forget um, a lot when people talk about, oh, we need to punish China for this, we need to put up barriers against them. I, I don't know if we'd be able to have this call if it wasn't for Chinese goods. I don't know what percentage or, of goods from his mouse or my microphone came from China, and if they didn't come from China, would, they have been, would I have been able to afford them? Um, and, and questions like that are really raised, especially when it comes to goods for the poorest in our society who might not be able to afford them if they were made locally. So, and, so, and, and adva advances in technology going on in Shenzhen and in, in, I mean, China's technology industry now is astonishing. You know, it's, it's really, I mean, clearly second only to the US's. Um, and we all benefit from that. You know, people always focus on the risks and the downsides and, oh, okay, yeah, sure, there are, there are perhaps some surveillance risks that we have to be careful of. But it's really, really good to have over a billion people 
um, able to engage in the global economy and to invent things and for us to be able to um, enjoy their inventions. You know, this is one of the insights that Michael Kramer, who won the Nobel Prize recently, um, had, just that um, producing things um, is something that we have to think about in a per capita way, but producing ideas isn't. Um, an idea is just as useful to a billion people as it is to a hundred people or a million people. And um, so the more people we have producing ideas, um, the better it is in absolute terms for the whole world. And um, that's what we're beginning to get from China. And to try to cut that off or to try to shut that down or balkanize it in some way so that um, Chinese inventions benefit China and kind of Western US inventions benefit the West, I think would really, really be self-defeating. And Saeed, what, what bringing you in here, what do you think about what Sam has said on that? Do you broadly agree? Uh, can protectionism be justified against a rogue state? Um, is there even questions about compensation coming from China? What, give me your thoughts. Well, I think the issue of China um, raises uh, one of these issues that many classical liberals find a dilemma. Because we, we look upon it in terms of economics and trade. And we think, you know, we, we are free traders. That the best way to open up countries and open up markets and, uh, and, and make them open up to the world is through contact, through trade. And as the middle class get richer and they pay taxes, they'll want some sort of accountability for those taxes. And that will eventually lead to some more accountability and political, uh, and political accountability. And there are models for this, such as South Korea, for example. You know, as the middle class become richer and they pay tax, they start saying, what are we paying our taxes for? They want accountability. And you saw some transitions to uh, de democracy in countries such as South Korea. But you cannot separate as much as we like, to, would like to do, you cannot separate trade from politics. In fact, international trade is a tool of international politics. Um, and that means that you cannot just consider these issues on trade issues alone or economic issues. And I think a lot of the demand for action against China will be from politicians, but it'll also be as a result of pressure internally. So for example, there is already quite a lot of pressure building up in the UK on the Chinese treatment of the, uh, of the Hong Kong residents. And I saw Sam, for example, I think it was, who wrote an article about resettling Hong Kong residents in the UK where we've, where we've got space. Wouldn't they be a great, huge boost to, 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 to our economy? And therefore, action against China might come for those reasons. And politicians, whether they like it or not, when they receive a letter from their constituents or, receive, or are interviewed on the media, they have to be seen to be doing something. So I think that's the problem we have with this issue is, I would say, that let's stay open with them, let's trade with them. Um, there clearly are concerns and it shows, it means that we don't care if we just, or it gives the impression that we don't care if we just say, well, let's go carry on as, as, uh, as before. Now, I think with China, you have to separate the issues. And the, the issue is everything becomes China bashing as opposed to tackling specific issues. So, for example, I think what we have to do is be critically engaged with China on those specific issues. The UK government and the US government should be more robust with China on Hong Kong, for example. We should try and get to the bottom of the processes at the beginning of the outbreak of COVID. Did, you know, was there a deliberate, no, did it come from that lab in Wuhan? Was it accidental? Was it initially that China thought that it could deal with it itself and then it got out of control? Um, there is this concept in Chinese culture called Mian Zhu, and not losing face. And I can see perhaps the Chinese thought, oh, we can control this, we don't need to tell the rest of the world, and then it got out of control. Or actually, you no, know, was it a deliberate attempt? No, I don't really think it was a deliberate attempt, but I could, be, uh, I could be proven wrong. What's interesting, given that China is not a democracy and there's no accountability, whereas in the UK and other countries, you see politicians going on TV every day, giving press conferences and having to be accountable to their electorate for the actions they're taking over COVID. The Chinese government doesn't have to do this in any way. So what they can do is prepare for the world after COVID. And one of the things I'm finding very interesting in discussions with a lot of uh, foreign policy experts is how China is preparing itself for the post-COVID world. Our politicians are still focusing on the current world and trying to get us out of lockdown, whereas the, pol the Chinese politicians are already focusing on how China uh, could take advantage of the uncertainty um, and the post-COVID world. And that's something we have to be careful about. But overall on China, I think we have to, we have to focus on the specific issues. Hong Kong, intellectual property. What did you know about COVID initially? And how do we make sure that if it happens again, you share the data early enough with the WTO? And if there are other issues, deal with the issues without it looking like it's China bashing. I, I agree with that. And one thing I would add to the point about COVID is that um, there is a risk that 
we try to excuse bad responses by our own governments um, by blaming, perhaps there may be blame uh, due, I'm, I'm certain there is blame due to, to the Chinese government, but that doesn't let us off the hook either. And it's hard to see, given that we knew that COVID was bad in early February, late, late January, uh, we didn't in the UK lock down for uh, much longer, um, and, uh, much longer after uh, many European countries did. Um, it's hard to see what knowing about COVID two weeks earlier would have done to change the UK or the US response, for example. And I fear that um, the Chinese uh, point, while it's important for us to to look into it and important for us to to make sure we know what happened, I fear that it may end up being used by governments and defenders of governments here to uh, basically try to excuse their own very, very poor handling of the crisis. Yeah, that's very interesting. So what you guys both touched on in your introduction was the idea that long supply chains and just-in-time deliveries have been very useful for us so far, um, but they're also quite fragile and vulnerable to disruption in cases like COVID-19 and one-off events. So, Sam, you mentioned that businesses are best to kind of consider those risks rather than government, but do you think a conversation does need to be had be had more broadly about this trade-off between easier and more uh, easier to access goods at cheaper prices versus the disruption they could cause if the system does go down. What are your thoughts on that? I have to say, I think that the system has done remarkably well, given that we're living through um, the worst pandemic in 100 years at least, um, and a completely unprecedented um, in modern times lockdown of almost every single developed country on earth. Um, I, I'm completely astonished by how robust supply chains have been. And the fact that supermarkets, for example, have um, pretty much avoided shortages altogether, um, with the exception of a few days uh, in the immediate aftermath of the lockdown announcement. I think it's stunning how effective um, in almost every respect, and that there are a few exceptions in almost every respect, how robust our supply chains have been, including supply chains extending well outside of the UK. Um, the exceptions are things that were... Um, probably not unforeseeable, but were unforeseen, like PPE, personal protective equipment, um, where I think that the real um, blame or the real uh, kind of problem has been that we haven't changed policy fast enough to, um, to correct for the exposure we have, for example, to this kind of problem. So if the UK is very reliant on PPE produced in China, for example, and for political and COVID-related reasons, um, it's difficult for us to get the kind of volumes of PPE that we would like. I have have seen almost nothing from the UK government um, in uh, terms of switching domestic production and in switching production from places where we can do business with rapidly to PPE. Um, There are proposals, for example, to guarantee uh, purchasing prices. So, for example, the UK government could absolutely guarantee to pay um, a certain amount for the first 10 billion face masks uh, produced every month, which would be a guarantee to UK suppliers that if they can get these things ready and if they can re-equip their factories to produce these things, that they will have a guaranteed price. And this would give us certainly, certainly very rapidly give us a very, very large amount, maybe maybe way too much, but that's okay because we're in a crisis and it's better to have too much than too little of this stuff. Um, and yet I've seen very, very little um, and, and very uh, there's really been not very much at all from uh, the UK government in doing this. So yes, we have been exposed on a few very, very critically important things, but it seems to me that there's, just, there's been just as much lack of foresight on, on the part of the UK government and on the part of, for example, Public Health England in uh, stockpiling these things comp- uh, and very, very little lack of kind of willingness to adapt and to rapidly change policy and to do quite dramatic changes to policy um, to fix these things. And I don't have very much confidence that governments that haven't been able to anticipate this crisis um, and, and, I, and I certainly didn't myself, I, I'm not blaming them for, for this, but I have no confidence that they will in future be able to anticipate whatever the next crisis is and make the correct adjustments. I'd much rather that we got better at rapidly adapting to changes in circumstance and rapidly responding to crises rather than some kind of, um, I think, very, very foolish and, and very difficult to achieve hope that we can plan for every possible eventuality and um, at, at potentially great cost to ourselves. Right, so more mitigation, so more an adapt, adaption approach rather than a mitigation approach. Said, do you agree with that? Yeah, um, yes, I, I do. I, mean, I think uh, Sam's absolutely right when it comes to the supply chains and how they've held up. And what's interesting when you, you know, when you look at your shopping now every week, you may not be getting exactly what you had before, 
uh, and the brands you want, but at, you know, but you are getting more or less most of the uh, products that you would have bought before. Not completely, and most people accept that because of you know it's much better than it was in the first week, uh, if you like. But it shows how private companies that make business decisions, they know they have customers who want to buy their goods, ha ha have adapted. Now there have been some suggestions, um, as you know, both Sam and I intimated earlier on, about alternatives to the current supply chains. Um, you know, there are some talks, some people have been speaking about, well, let's build in some redundancy, which means, you know, have two uh, suppliers or two people producing the same thing. That, in, that increases costs. Um, what about uh, holding stock? That makes you less flexible if you have to change products. But also, it costs money to store stuff. One of the reasons, you know, they don't have large, such as large warehouses is because they rely on just-in-time, which reduces those storage costs. Um, and for example, reshoring, you know, it's not as simple as you think. There was a reason why production moved abroad in the first place. Now, if those reasons can be overcome, then there might be some examples of reshoring, or it might be more politically driven, as, with, you know, as when Trump came to power in the US and tried to get more local production. Um, but I think on the whole, most companies will see this as um, it was a one-off event. Yes, it might, have, it might not be another 100 years before the next pandemic. It might be more regular, especially with global movements in terms of trade and people. Uh, but you no, know, we can tough this one out. We'll think about how we prepare for next time. But we're going to go back to the supply chains we had before. That doesn't mean that all companies will go back. There will be some companies who will undoubtedly look at uh, you know, reshoring and redundancy and um, uh, building up greater stocks. But it really depends very much on company by company basis, very much as Hayek would have said, you know, don't take a macro picture of this, look at the micro picture, the individual uh, exchanges and transactions between individuals and companies along the supply chain, and they will make millions and millions of different decisions. Um, I don't think we could say now that this will definitely happen. Yeah, so besides the great toilet roll shortage of 2020 that lasted for about two days, uh, private companies have done quite good to kind of respond to this crisis. Except to be honest, in the US, I know speaking to friends and family in the US, there are still parts of the US where they've got toilet roll shortages, and, which is amazing when you think about the US economy. Um, so, you know, it really would be an interesting uh, research uh, at some point to see why the US continue to have shortages. What was it about the US economy? or parts of the US economy. I know, for example, uh, friends in LA and my family in, in, in Florida, for example, have told me that it's still difficult to get hold of toilet rolls. One reason, is, one reason is that they, in some cases, have stricter anti-price uh, gouging or so-called price gouging rules. In California, for example, during an, during an emergency, it's illegal to raise the price of any product by more than 10%, and it's considered to be um, anti-consumer anti exploitation if you do so. Now, in the UK, um, we did have the Competition and Markets Authority, the CMA, uh, kind of warn businesses that um, it would be investigating them if they did this. Um, I mean, really, they, I think they have very little grounds to do that, given that its, um, that it's, it's remit is not really about um, kind of fairness. Its remit is about protecting consumers, and it would have to show that consumers were worse off because of this, and I think it would find it very difficult to do that. Um, but I think that may be one reason that they have put into law what we have um, sort of, you know, tutted our fingers at um, shots about doing instead. But there were some local examples. I know in London, there was a shop in northwest London that was shut down, not by the government, by, but by local trading standards, after they raised the price really? on their... Uh, I think a couple of customers took to YouTube or uh, Twitter or Facebook to uh, highlight the, the, what they called the price exploitation. And the local trading centres came in and shut the shop down. Which actually, I, I wondered, but does that mean those, those, those goods in the shop were no longer available? They'd been yeah. taken out of the market. <laughs> It is, right. It's also, it's kind of an interesting thing because supermarkets for reputational reasons obviously have not increased their prices. And so it's been very difficult. It's been more difficult to get things like eggs and flour um, in most supermarkets than it has in independent local shops where um, they have been much freer to increase their prices. Um, and now I kind of understand why the supermarkets don't want to have people complaining and people who would find this very unfair, even if it was actually good overall. Um, but it does show the value in um, having these kind of independent shops, even if some of the time they can be quite expensive. So talking about, it, because that's sort of a competition policy law. So on the similar subject, what do you think trade is going to look like after Corona in the, in the sense of protectionism? Do we think it's just going to be increasing tariffs? Or as you mentioned in your introduction talk, you think it's going to be more subtle non-tariff barriers as a way to uh, put up walls? 
or and also is it just going to be an acceleration from existing countries that are doing that or do you think that new countries are going to hop on board and everyone's going to pile up um for it well i think um we will i think so part of the things we will see i think um are a greater use of national security tools as i t discussed in my opening remarks I think we may also um, see greater moves towards kind of what are called national champions, um, which are kind of either explicitly or implicitly state sponsored businesses um, that may not be great for competition domestically. But the idea is that these are kind of able to compete on the global stage. Uh, for example, um, I'd be really interested to hear Said's views of the Siemens Alstom merger. And these are two companies that make uh, trains, the London Underground, I think um, rolling stock is, I think it may be entirely made by Alstom, but at least a lot of it is. Um, and the French and German governments have been very much in favour of a merger on kind of national champion grounds, even though the European Commission, which has responsibility for overseeing these kinds of things, uh, blocked the merger on competition grounds. Their view was that this would be, um, this would have unfair market dominance and would be able to raise prices on European consumers. Um, the Franco, the Franco German view was that we need this huge giant, which maybe can overcharge European consumers in order to be able to compete with Chinese suppliers of trains. Um, now, I think that's a, it's a kind of an interesting question. Now, I'm firmly in the view that um, we should not be making decisions on the basis of creating national champions. Um, I think that's a, it's a really bad way to do competition policy. Um, but there are arguments that, for example, maybe it's um, just not fit for purpose. Maybe if we're looking too narrowly at um, domestic markets, that um, it's a mistake to stop companies from merging and getting quite large if really those companies are competing on a global level. Um, so I think I, I don't think it's an obvious or a very, I, I don't think it's completely obvious what the, um, the correct decision is in that kind of case. The other is that um, I take the view, but I think there's a lot of uh, debate that one can take about this, that um, the European Commission has been very, very, very anti-tech uh, because those tech companies tend to be American. Um, I think that um, this view basically is that the European Commission's approach to American tech companies, for example, in the Google Shopping case, uh, their ongoing investigations of most of the American, the big American tech companies like Amazon, um, for, for various reasons, and um, you know, some have some merit, some have, I think, much less merit. But um, there's an open question as to whether similar investigations would be taking place if Amazon was, say, a French company, or if Facebook was a Swedish company. Um, my own kind of gut instinct is probably not. And in that case, this is another example of competition policy being used as a tool for protectionism. And I think that the European Union has a deep anxiety about the absence of European companies on the global uh, kind of tech stage. There are very, very few large European tech companies, um, almost no large European tech platforms, which are the, the really, really controversial ones from a competition point of view. And I suspect that the European Commission is trying to use competition policy as a way of basically defending infant industries, of defending domestic um, kind of smaller tech companies in the hope that eventually they will get to a stage where they can compete. And I think that's not a good way of looking at how uh, trade works, but it's very popular. And um, if that's the case, and I, and I may well be wrong, I, I want to say this is opinion rather than um, deep analysis. Um, if that's true, then it's very, very difficult to know how we, how we approach that. Um, the UK really doesn't have much influence after Brexit, but European citizens um, may find it may find that in order to open trade, it's, um, it requires a change in competition policy to uh, basically stop targeting US tech companies just because they're American. Okay, so Saeed, you were an MEP for 14 years, I think it was. Yes. Is the EU anti-tech? Is what Sam's saying the truth? Well, uh, before I come to that, I wonder if I could just uh, cover one of the issues that Sam talked about in terms Absolutely. of what, what will limit uh, competition. One, he's, he's quite right when he talks about national security issues. The other issue that will become a, a, an increasing factor is, is the environment. And as more and more countries adopt, or governments adopt a net zero uh, carbon by, say, 2050 or even earlier, consumers and others will argue, well, hold on a minute, it's all very well us having net zero, um, but what about uh, goods that are produced in other countries? And people are becoming more aware that earlier environmental measures have simply meant that you know, smokestack industries have shut down in Europe and, and America and moved to China and produced even more CO2 uh, th 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 than before. And with that awareness, there's been, there have been moves and push, it, push for um, what they call uh, border adjustment measures, which is effectively a tariff or a trade barrier 
to countries with lower environmental standards. And I think you'll start to see more and more of that uh, when, when the world uh, re-emerges from COVID, as well as national security issues. And of course, as Sam has said, national security has been an issue or is considered more of an issue during this crisis, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China. Interestingly enough, not so much vis-a-vis -vis some of the other countries that people had concerns about before, such as Iran or, or Russia, for example, but maybe because Iran's had its own COVID problem and hasn't really dealt with COVID um, very well. The second thing is, it's interesting, when I was an MEP, what was very interesting was some of the biggest complainants against some of the American tech giants were other American companies. And I remember when um, Microsoft was, under the, uh, was being analysed for so-called anti-competitive behaviour. And, you know, I would make the argument, look, it's just technology. Everyone thought IBM was going to be dominant, but the market changed and now it became software. The same thing will happen to Microsoft. And I remember warning a lobbyist from Google who came and tried to you know, harangue me and say, we should be, you know, we should be curtailing um, Microsoft. I said, just be careful, guys, because it will be you next. And they just said, oh, no, it will never happen to us. And sure enough, a few years later, the other American companies were going to Brussels saying we have to curb the dominance of Google um, and more Facebook. Now, there are concerns to be had about some of these companies, not because they're American, but because we're all learning about data. Up to now, if you think about something like Facebook, we were quite happy to use Facebook because it was a free service. We didn't think about it. We didn't think about the cost. When you compare it to some of its competitors before, such as Friends with United, that you had to pay a fee, here's a free service that you can connect to the rest of the world, you know, get hold of some of your old mates, and you're not paying anything for it. Great. But what we didn't realize, that the cost we were paying was giving away our data. Now, as we've all gone up that learning curve, we've now all become wiser to the fact that data has value, not only to companies, but for our own privacy and our own peace of mind. And I think some of the concerns about American tech companies, yes, it is about them being American, there's no doubt about it, and Europe always wants champions, but it's also complaints from other American companies, but it's also more and more concerns about the use of data as we've become more aware of, of data. Yeah, it's a great point. So one thing, I was, we're fast running out of time. One thing Mark Littlewood, the Director General at the IA, always tries to do, he tries to end on a positive, upbeat note. And I'm going to try that today. So some final thoughts from Sam first and turning to Saeed, just for a minute or two. Do classical liberals, free marketeers, do we have anything to be optimistic about? Today's been a bit pessimistic, a bit downbeat. Is, or is, have we just got an uphill slog from here on out? Sam, give us your final thoughts. Always remember Adam Smith's words. There's a great deal of ruin in a nation. Um, governments really, really can fuck up a lot of things and um, life still goes on, life still gets better. Um, I don't think the uh, scars from COVID are going to be that enduring. I think that when we um, do find a cure or a vaccine or some uh, durable way of controlling the virus, I think our lives will basically go back to normal. And then the great debates just will continue to rage on. This is one of them. Um, we don't always lose, we don't always win. Um, but life goes on and technology keeps us progressing. Absolutely. And global well-being has increased drastically over the last 200 years. And I doubt uh, coronavirus will prevent it. Saeed, what are your thoughts? Well, if you look at the WTO chart that I talked about earlier, even though uh, it impacted on growth in trade volumes, they bounced back. And even though the trajectory wasn't the same as before, it was still growing. And I think we should never underestimate human ingenuity. The great thing about classical liberals is that we believe in human ingenuity. We believe in the ability of mankind to further their own, uh, their own uh, interests. Uh, um, but in furthering their own interests, they also um, create a better world for, for all of us. And I think what's going to happen is going to happen. We will learn some things from COVID. Maybe as individuals, we'll be far more reflective about life. We won't take things for granted. Um, but at the same time, we will want to get back uh, to normal, you know, uh, ju ju even during the war, during the depths of World War II, people were saying, keep buggering on, you know, we, we, we will continue. And there will, you know, there will still be innovation, there will still be ideas, and there will also still be the ideological battles that we face every day. But overall, I think that you know, the world will continue to get better. The rate of growth might be slightly less than before COVID, but the world will get better. I I'm optimistic. What a great point to end on. Syed and Sam, thank you so much for your time today and providing those fascinating insights. Um, one thing I'm also very optimistic about 
is the future of our IA YouTube channel and the great content that will be uploaded there every single day. Um, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon as well so you get updated whenever we release our new video. Um, you can also follow our podcasts at iapodcast.podbean.com and finally you can also visit our website ia.org.uk where you can sign up for both our daily and weekly newsletters. Um, also, a big thank you to donors who make events like this possible. If you can help us financially in any way at all, no matter how modest, we appreciate it greatly and it helps us keep events like this going strong. Um, and you can find the details on the IA website. Sam Bowman and Saeed Kamal, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Keep safe, keep well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>